Patience is one of the hallmarks of Christian living. Oftentimes when roadblocks and spiritual opposition comes our way, we are simply told to be patient. Just have more patience. Sometimes being patient is an appropriate response, but other times not. So how do we know when to wait and when to move? How do we know when to sit back and be patient and when to actively take action? This question came up this week, and it can trap many Christians in a form of analysis paralysis. Never sure when to take action or simply accept what's happening. So today, we're going to explore this vital question, and we're going to get a clear picture from Scripture on how to proceed in whatever situation we find ourselves. Hi, I'm Jim. I'd like to welcome you to Thriving Branch today as we explore when to be patient versus when to move. This is a question that came up this week in response to another video series that we did about the blessings and promises. The question was raised, if we have all of these blessings and promises in Christ, but we're not experiencing all of them, should we wait or should we take action? And when should we wait? And when should we actively move towards our blessings? It's a good question. And it's one that I found can trap many believers. But the answer to the question might not be what you're expecting. Should I wait? Or should I act? And the biblical, scriptural answer is, the choice is yours. You see, as we begin our study, an essential fact to understand is that whether we choose to act or not in any given situation is our choice. That part may be obvious. What might not be so obvious is the fact that God has given us delegated spiritual authority and discretion on what actions we take. And keep in mind, everything that I'm speaking about right now is in a spiritual context. And there's a proclivity among many Christians to adopt a default state of passivity spiritual passivity that stems from a desire to be humble. You may have experienced this before. You may have heard others speak about it before. You may have even thought this in your own life. But when it comes to resisting spiritual forces, when it comes to receiving spiritual blessings, absolute passivity is not a recipe for success. The scriptures repeatedly encourage us to stand against the devil, to stand against spiritual strongholds. And part of God's armor, which we studied a few weeks ago, is the sword of the spirit to actively cut through the spiritual brushwood and the thorns that can so often hinder us. Romans chapter 16, verse 20 states that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. And this tells us a few important details. First, the verse tells us that it is the God of peace that crushes Satan. Sometimes we get the idea that it is our personal mission to crush Satan, or to stamp out the devil wherever he may be. But actually, it's God who accomplishes 
this task. Specifically, the God of peace, that is, the peace which comes from Jesus Christ. And there's another aspect to the victory that we have over the devil. The God of peace crushes Satan under your feet. And the fact that it's your feet that crush Satan speaks to our unity with Christ. And that's an aspect that should not be quickly moved beyond. Because many of us have issues or an issue believing that we are actually in unity with Christ today. We may sing songs about it. We may read it in many scripture verses. But when it comes to actively believing it, receiving it, living it, we often don't think or believe that we are in unity with Christ. But that's exactly what we are because that's exactly what he has made us. And what Romans chapter 16 verse 20 tells us is that we are the ones standing and walking above Satan through the power of the God of peace, which is Jesus Christ. And this same idea is mirrored in the description of the armor of God when it refers to the shoes of peace. What do you think you do with those shoes? You stand, you walk. That's Ephesians 6.15, which we studied when we studied God's armor. God is the one who crushes Satan under our feet, but we are the ones who need to do the standing and the walking and the stepping. And this goes to making the choice about whether to wait or to actively move, when to be patient, when to actually take action. The perfect example of taking action can be found in John chapter 5. In one of the most intriguing accounts of healing, this is one of the healings that I love to read all the time. Let's take a look at John chapter 5 verses 2 through 5 now. Read this with me. John chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. Ready? One, two, read. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of weak folk, of blind, halt, and withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Now take a moment to consider the scene in these verses. There was a great number of people with various conditions waiting at the Bethesda pool. And at a certain season, an angel would come and stir the water. And when this happened, whoever entered the pool first would be healed. Now if you're like me, you might be wondering, why would God do something like that? Is the Bethesda pool some kind of healing lottery? Well, as I always like to say, there are no insignificant details in the scripture. Everything in this account has a spiritual significance and can give us insight. We see in verse 3 that there are three categories of weaknesses mentioned blind, halt, and withered. 
And these descriptions can give us a better understanding of the picture being painted here. Think of it. Think of what's going on. Draw the own picture in your mind. An angel comes to stir up the water. And whoever gets into the pool first is the one who's healed. Well, the chances of the blind ones being first are unlikely because they won't see the water being stirred until it's too late. The halt, which is those with paralysis, won't be able to move into the pool when the water is stirred. And if they do get there, it certainly won't be first. And the withered, those with general strength deficiencies, won't be able to move fast enough or long enough to get into the pool. Remember, only the first one into the pool would be healed. So it's an intriguing and admittedly puzzling picture of a unique occurrence being described. So what's the point of it? Well, let's continue on with verses 6 through 9. Verses 6 through 9 now, and let's read together. Ready? One, two, read. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said to him, Will you be made whole? And the weak man answered Jesus, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. This is where things really get interesting. In verse 6, Jesus comes onto this scene and he says to the paralyzed man who was lying there, Will you be made whole? Now you can just imagine what was going through the paralyzed man's mind. Being in that condition for 38 years, watching others reach the pool before him, others getting there first at every opportunity, and the man slowly starting to accept defeat. Watching others get there before him, year after year, suffering his paralysis, never being able to get there. Then we see Jesus who sees the man lying there, helpless, asks the man a question that seems somewhat rude. Will you be made whole? Or in other words, do you want to be healed? And while that question might put some people off, as it did me the first time I read it, Jesus wasn't actually being rude here. Jesus is asking a question, a specific question, designed to refocus the man's attention off of the pool and onto the real source of healing, the healer, which is Jesus himself. In verse 7, the man's response to Jesus exposes where his vision was really focused. The man explained that he didn't have anyone to help him into the pool. But that's not what Jesus asked him. Jesus didn't want the man to focus on the pool at all. But Jesus simply asked him, do you want to be healed? That's a different question than why aren't you healed? He said, do you want to be healed? 
How would a typical Christian today respond to Jesus's question? I've been involved in discussions where people have stated that if God wanted them healed, they would already be healed. And that's specifically seeking healing would be some sort of greed or avarice on the part of the sick person. I've heard people say that. So how would you answer Jesus' question if it was asked of you today? What's the best answer to his question? Let's take a look at this story some more. You see, there are many possible responses to Jesus' question. Could you imagine if the man answered, No thanks, I'm good, don't need to be healed. The question asked by Jesus cuts to the core of our topic today regarding when to be patient and when to take action. At its basic level, each of us needs to answer this question. What do you want? Have you ever actually thought about it? A simple question like that. What do you want? What do you want Jesus to give you? You see, much like God told Joshua, in Joshua chapter 13, verse 1, he said, There's still much of the promised land left unclaimed. That's an interesting thing to say. But have you ever stopped to ask why? Why was the promised land left unclaimed? You see, I believe that that is a piece of information that we still need to understand. And there's a truth there that we need to comprehend as well. Jesus is our promised land today. And in him, we are freely given all things, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 32. But just as with Joshua, and the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda here, we sometimes find ourselves waiting. And we sometimes wait for our entire lives because we've been looking in the wrong direction all along. Or maybe, just maybe, we've been believing the wrong thing about Jesus about what he accomplished, about ourselves. It's something to consider. As we see in verses 8 and 9, Jesus' next statement entirely ignores the pull again. Jesus tells the man three things. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Each of those things means something, not only physically, but spiritually. The physical aspect of this entire story is fairly obvious. It's the spiritual aspect that we need to meditate on and consider. First, Jesus tells the man to rise. In other words, do now what you couldn't do in your own strength. Realize that in Christ, you have power over the devil. You are not weak and powerless any longer. Second, Jesus tells him, take up your bed. In other words, remove any artifacts from the old self. Remember that you are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. 
The old sinner is dead and gone, crucified on the cross with Christ, according to Scripture. So don't leave any reminders of the old self, because that's not who you are anymore. That's not your spiritual identity any longer. Third, Jesus tells the man, walk. Continue on your new path in Christ. Live your new identity in him. And don't let anything ever drag you back. You don't have to wait for what's already yours. I encourage you today that as we studied a few weeks ago, today is the day of salvation, soteria, provision, deliverance, redemption, protection. Today is the day. Now is the time. There is no reason to wait for anything that Jesus has already paid to give you. There are many things in life that require patience, such as the deliverance of friends or loved ones, because we don't have power over the personal decisions of others. However, when it comes to the blessings and promises of God, which he has already shown to you personally and paid such a high price to give you, there's no reason to wait. No reason to wait at all. It's the difference between the old covenant and the new, law and grace. Jesus made all the difference to the man at the pool. Jesus could have easily said, go wash in the pool. Or he could have said, I'll call another angel down and I'll help you into the pool. He didn't do that. The pool did not even enter into the picture of this man's healing once Jesus arrived on the scene. The man didn't have the strength in himself to merit healing by being the first one to enter that pool. But Jesus, the bringer of grace, the true healer, came to the man. Those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, that's your answer. I look forward to thriving with you again. Be blessed. Thank you for joining me for today's Bible study. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others. And be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so that you never miss a video. I also invite you to check out thrivingbranch.com where you'll find a lot more information and resources on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'd also like to let you know that you can help support me in this ministry through your prayers, your sharing of the information with others, and through your financial giving as the Spirit of God leads you. Regardless of which way you choose, I want you to know that every single prayer, every single share, and every single financial gift is appreciated and really does help me in this ministry. I want to thank you again for your continued support and be blessed.